All right, everybody. So welcome to our course um, today, which is our transitions uh, course. As you know, I'm Dr. Wendy Greenwood in the Texas A&M University uh, School of Nursing in our transitions course. We have a very special guest speaker that I am very excited to bring to you. Um, and I'm going to introduce you. So I'm going to read a little bit about him so that you kind of understand, although we have talked about him just a, a little bit uh, in preparation for his visit. But Mr. Paul Merriman is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, and asset allocation. After retiring in 2012 from Merriman Wealth Management, which he founded in 1983, he created the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, which has been ever since then dedicated to providing investors of all ages with free information and tools to make informed decisions in their own best interest and successfully implement their retirement savings programs. Now, um, Paul is the author of eight books, including We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement and Financial Fitness uh, Forever. He uh, sorry, retirement, financial fitness forever, five steps for more money, less risk and more peace at mind, live it up without outliving your money and the how to invest series, which I'm making available to all of you guys on um, by giving you um, access to his website for all of these wonderful materials. He writes a regular column for um, the marketwatch.com, which um, I don't know if you are already um, subscribed to that, but wow, it's got some great content. And he produces a multi award winning weekly podcast called Sound Investing, which has been named by Money Magazine as the best money podcast. And I'm going to tell you, I'm a big fan of that podcast myself. So, um, Mr. Merriman, I just want to thank you for having the heart of a teacher and also for just really wanting to reach out to this next generation of young professionals and really to make or give them the tools that they need to make sound decisions and also to just set their life up as they move into being a new professional and making great decisions. So welcome and thank, thank you. you for talking to our group. Thank you, Wendy. I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, my mother was a nurse and that makes this presentation special to me. I know how hard she worked. I know how underpaid she was. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a story about how bad it was back then. She was, she didn't know it, but she was literally days away from earning a pension. And she was, uh, and they let her retire. And if they had just told her, I mean, talk about the importance of financial literacy. If they had just told her that if she worked another month that she would get a pension for life i'm sure she would have done it but um in those days it was it was tougher than they are than they are today but uh, i wish you well and i want you to know that you ever have a question well as long as i'm around here if you write to paul at paulmerriman.com just put texas a and m in the subject line, and I will know from from uh, whence it came, and will do my very best to answer that question for you. But for today, my job, along with Wendy's job, and I really respect what she is doing. It, it from my viewpoint, knowing uh, what happens to people over their lifetime and the decisions they make, and some are. Are, are okay and others are just terrible. The work that we're trying to do is to make sure that when you come to a fork in the road in the area of financial literacy or financial decision-making, you will know the right fork. I was out with our youngest granddaughter. She's about a year and a half or so. And we were about to go walking across the street. And of course, a big deal was made out of looking to the right and looking to the left. And she's learned how to do that. And, and, and she will probably do that for the rest of her life. Of course, she'll start second guessing how far away people are and, and, and micromanaging that decision of looking to the right and to the left. But it will be a part of her decision-making 
And I believe the type of work that Wendy is doing and what we are trying to do through our, our financial education foundation is to get you to look to the right and the left. And when you look to understand the implications of what you're seeing. And today I'm going to focus literally on 12 million dollar decisions so that you might ask you mean if i actually made these decisions the way that you're suggesting it might mean that i would have 12 million or more when i retire and the answer is absolutely yes and 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 you'll see that and and if if i don't live up to the uh, to this claim Paul at paulmerriman.com. You tell me where you think I'm wrong, but but this is what I'm talking about. This is important information. Mr. Warren, Merriman, oh, may I interrupt yes. for one second? Sure. Please. Um, do you have uh do you have your disclaimer in the presentation? I do not have a disclaimer in okay. my presentation. Can I read it for you? Please do. All right. So um, students, I just want to let you know that the content of this presentation is provided for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to substitute for obtaining professional financial, legal, or tax advice. Nothing contained in the presentation or by other means of communication by uh, Paul Merriman or those associated with the Merriman Financial Education Foundation implies a consulting or coaching relationship Please consult a licensed professional for advice on your own personal situation. The information provided today is based on past performances of the market and economic research and cannot predict the future results in the economy or market setting. And the speaker identifies that his books are available to purchase at retail sources and that all sales of books go to support his nonprofit education foundation. And many of those books that we talked about earlier and resources are provided free of charge for download on his website. All right, there, I just wanted to make sure we got that no, in there. So sorry. That, that's, that's great. And I would add, that I do not get a paid a penny, nor when you follow the work of Chris Patterson and Daryl Balls, other people who work on our foundation, we are volunteer only folks. And uh, so we're not trying to make money off of you, but we do want to give you information that will make you money. And by the way, what Wendy noted in that disclaimer is that you should see a professional. That is the suggestion. I will tell you, that it is the goal of the work that we do that you will be able to make 99.9% .9 of the decisions on your own. And the reason that that is important is because the minute you start reaching out for help, it is likely going to cost you money. And what we're trying to do is to keep that money in your family's pocket, not somebody else's. So there. And Warren Buffett uh, has said, and I think this is important, to be a success, and he wasn't just talking about investing, you only have to do a very few things right in your life as long as you don't do too many things wrong. And in the field of investing, there are a handful of things that are, are considered to be right. And, I, and I'm going to say that almost all of them come out of the academic uh, part of the industry, not off of Wall Street. And so it, 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 it is important that you understand that while there may be 10 or 20 things that really are the big decisions of your life, there are a thousand things they want you to do that are going to help their financial future instead of yours. And that is what I think the payoff is of getting an education. And the education that I think is most important is the math of investing. If you get the math, the rest of it just falls neatly into place. And let me just take you briefly through the math of investing. I've got my little bullet here I want to focus on two investors 
One investor is putting away $6,000. In fact, they're both putting away $6,000 a year. They do it for 40 years. In other words, they've invested $240,000 towards their retirement. And by the way, that would suggest that for many of you, probably most of you, that that means saving 10% of, 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 what your, of what your wage or salary will be which most of the experts say that's where you want to get to as soon as you can. If you can't, if you have to start at three or four or five percent, you want to be working your way up eventually to 10 percent. This assumption is six thousand dollars a year. That's it. You do it for 40 years and then you retire at age 65. And then you in retirement, you spend 30 years and your life ends at 95 so that Everything that you have not spent will be passed to somebody else. And between what was spent in retirement and what was passed to other people is basically the return on your retirement investments. So let's track that investment and let's track it with two investors, one that gets 8% during the accumulation period, that's the period you're about to enter, and then during the retirement period, you get a lower rate of return because when you're retired, you take less risk, and that you take out 4% every year to live on. This is kind of a industry standard as far as, as a goal, but what would you have gotten if you found a way instead of eight to get eight and a half, instead of six to get six and a half? Well, we can follow that math. This isn't the way real investing works. You don't get the same return every year, but the math you can set up so that you do represent kind of the compound rate of return that investments have made. And I'm going to show you exactly the investment that at least historically would lead to that eight and eight and a half percent return. Here's what we know. At age 65, at an 8% compound rate of return, you would retire with $1,678,000. If you then took out 4% a year over that 30 years, you would take withdrawals of 2.6 million. Now you put in 240, you compounded at eight and you took out 2.6 million. And when you passed on, you left $2.8 million so that you will know, of course you will have passed on now, so you won't know, but in theory, you will know that the return you got on your investment of $240,000 was the addition of what you spent and what you left to others, or in this particular case, $5.5 five, uh, $5 million. But if, and boy, this is a big if, you could make an extra half a percent during the accumulation and an extra half a percent during the distribution then you would have, instead of having 1.678, you'd have 1.924 in retirement to start. Instead of taking out 2.6 million, you would have taken out 3.2. Instead of living, leaving 2.8 million, you would leave 3.7. In other words, by finding an extra half of 1%, you would have added a total of $1.5 million dollars to your return. And the question becomes, if there's that kind of a payoff, who wouldn't want to find it if it's there? And if it's there, what do you need to do to go after it? Now, remember, there is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. But let me show you, knowing what we do about the past, the implications of that. But before we do, I want you to see one more thing that's important. And that is if instead of a half a percent, you found 1% a year, that would take it up to 9% and 7%. And you might th be thinking, well, I doubled my $1.5 million to or whatever it is to 3 million. No, you get up to 3.5 million because now you've got more money building on more money. 
And that compounding impact added an extra $500,000. So if we could figure, let, let me just give you, let me just give you one very simple, it isn't even one of the $12 million decisions. How could a person earn an extra 1% a year? Well, if you could invest like a professional, but you didn't have to hire a professional, I can tell you because I was one of those professionals who did this for a living for people. Most of them get a 1% fee. So for 1%, I become your investment advisor. I don't do that anymore, but that's what I did. And so if over your lifetime, you had paid an investment advisor 1% a year, starting from the very first day you started putting money away until you died, you would, in essence, have received 1% less in the return that you got over the rest of your life if you paid that 1%. And here is what I think is the most hopeful thing that I can offer you. There is so much information available to you today that it is absolutely dirt simple to know how to invest the same way that those people who get paid 1% tell their clients to invest. You just have to have the confidence and the trust to be able to do it. And of course, the education, that's what people like myself are trying to do. So let's look at one more example. Let's say that not only did you put away that $6,000, but let's say you pitched in and every year you raised that, that amount of money by 3%. So the first year it's 6,000 and the next year it's 6,180. And every year you up it, almost like you're, you're getting a raise and you're passing a part of that raise uh, to, uh, to yourself in retirement. Look what happens. You pick up because of the extra approximately $200,000 that you would have invested by raising it every year, a little bit at a time, you would have picked up another $3.5 million. You are now up to $12 million. If you could yourself, by the way, put more in, you take your part of this process, and I'll be showing you more about that later. But your involvement in putting that extra 3% in, that's a really big deal over the long term. And finally, and this is the thing that a lot of people, uh, beginning investors are surprised because you're starting with so little money. And in those first five years, let's say, it's not like you're putting away a fortune and yet if you can get started earlier in this particular case, a five-year difference, one starts at 25 and the other one starts at 30. So one invests for 35 years instead of 40. So there's a round of 30,000 plus difference in how much was put to work. And yet, and yet over a lifetime, that extra five years has the impact of $4.66 million extra money in your pocket. So those are all just little pieces of the math. Now, I, as I said earlier, it isn't smooth and easy like that. The market doesn't give you a little bit of profit every day or every year, or every month. It is, there's volatility. And we'll talk about that volatility so you understand what to expect. But then once you understand that math, it seems to me that what you need to learn is the history. And before I'm done, I'm going to show you a table that I think is probably one of the finest teaching tools that I've ever used or found to help people really understand what the history of investing looks like. So here again, we have Warren Buffett, because now I'm going to be talking about saving. Do not say what is left over after spending, but spend what is left over after saving. This is exactly what's happening right now 
in the 401k, in the 403b markets that you're all going to walk into as you go to work. Most plans, most retirement plans where you start putting your hard-earned money in, most of them now have it set up so that when you start investing or start working, they automatically extract a certain percentage. It varies with the company, but extracts a certain amount of your paycheck so that you never see it and it automatically gets invested in a kind of investment that I'm going to show you here, here before I'm done and that I think is the greatest retirement investment product ever invented uh, by our industry. But it starts with you being willing to save. Now, that's a fork in the road. That's a look into the right and look into the left fork in the road. It's huge because if you don't save and over 50% of the people when they are 55 years old have not saved for retirement, you are unlikely to end up being a multimillionaire. And by the way, when I talk about a, being a multimillionaire, that is not the big deal it used to be. When I was your age, uh, I went into the investment community, into the business. I was a stockbroker for about three years in the 1960s. And uh, at that time, everybody dreamed they might have someday have a million dollars. Well, what a million dollars meant in 1966 when I started in the industry is more like about six or seven million dollars today if we adjust it for inflation. And so what I think we need to be thinking in terms of is not just wanting to be a millionaire, but wanting to be, by the way, a multimillionaire based on what we take out and what we leave to others. I am not picturing Scrooge McDuck jumping into a pile of coins. I'm talking about what I think people are going to need because of, uh, of inflation. So we need to figure out how much do we need to save, where to save, these are real simple choices, and I'll talk about them, but I want you emotionally, and this is important because, because investing has two huge, huge hurdles. One is the expenses of investing. I've already mentioned somebody gets 1% to take care of your money is going to cost you millions of dollars over a lifetime. The other one is is not as easy to identify. It's the emotions of the process. And a lot of people, when you talk about saving, it feels like, oh, you're taking away my, my joy of spending. I want to spend. I want to enjoy. I want to travel. I want to dress and drive right. All those things that lead to spending. And I'm not a opposed to spending. I will tell you that every, every company I know wants, almost every company wants you to spend. That is what they need you to do for them to make what they need to make. But I can tell you that spending, I should say saving, is not about saving and, 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 and never using. No, saving is about spending later. It's all about spending later, and if not by you, by your heirs. And again, I just, when I said follow the math and showed you that extra five years, let me show you some numbers. One of you, two of you, maybe all of you are going to have a family someday and have a child someday. And when you do, you will have a fork in the road. You will look to the right and the left, and you will decide do I want to do something to help my child? In my case, our case, it's our grandchildren. When they are born, we start a pool for them. We start with a little more money than this, but look what this turns into. A dollar a day from the day a child is born. 
until they're 65. Now, I'm not asking you to do it till they're 65, but I would say, how about until they're 21 to start the, the tradition going? And then hopefully you will have motivated them and taught them and shared with them why you're doing this. But from, from, from birth to age 65, at 10%, that is just a market rate of return over the last 94, 96 years, would turn into $1.9 million. And that, by the way, could be in a Roth IRA, not immediately, but later when they start earning money, this dollar a day you put away could be put into a Roth IRA. Now, you could wait. You could wait until the child is 10. And notice what happens. Instead of having 1.9 million, you have about 750,000. Over a million dollar difference because of 10 years of $365 a year. That difference between 755 and $1.96 million is 10 times $365, $3,650. And then if you wait until they're 21 to start, and maybe what you do is you you put in some, they put in some, to, so they get some, some money of their own involved, that would then grow to be worth 262. My hope is you will never forget the impact, whether it's for you, for a child, someday for a grandchild, of starting early. So as you then decide to invest for the long term, you come to a fork in the road. This is the biggest looking right and looking left decision you're going to make. And that is, do I put my, my, my long-term money that I'm going to use to retire on, do I put it into bonds, which is in essence a loan to the government or a loan to a corporation, and they borrow the money from you and they say, and we promise to pay you back your $1,000, plus we will pay you 6% interest. And that's how a bond works. So there's a guarantee. Now, if the government fails, if the corporation fails, then you may not get paid back. But in most cases, people do. And... People love them because they're safe and they have very little short-term risk. On the other hand, move into the stock market. Now you own a part of that company and you do not get a promise of any kind of interest. And you do not get a guarantee that you'll get your $1,000 back 10, 20, 30 years from now. But what you do get is you get a part of the earnings, just like every other shareholder in whatever public company it is. If it grows at 10 or 20% a year, your holding is going to grow at 10 or 20% a year. And it turns out that the short-term risk is very high because you could actually, there was one day in 1987, October 19th, 1987, the stock market went down 22% in one day. Now that year, the market was up 5%, but that one day, people lost one fifth of their life savings if they had it in the stock market. On the other hand, if you waited a year or two, you were way ahead. But there's no question, and this is a, the reason that a lot of people do not invest in the stock market, is because on a short-term basis, it can be risky. But we really need to see what the return is for taking that risk. Here we are, bonds short-term government bonds going back to 1928, compound rate of return, that's the growth rate that money piled on top of money. 3.3% was the average growth rate over that 96-year period. And $100 grew to be worth 2,000. Longer-term bonds, 
that aren't immediately almost within 30 days, for example, maturing and giving people their money back, okay, you're taking a little bit of risk and you got a premium for that little bit of risk. The return was 4.9. Now, instead of 2,000, you get 9,500. Still a government bond. Even longer term government bonds, the longer the maturity, the more their potential uh, short-term volatility, but nothing like the stock market. But look at here, the compound rate of return was 5.2, and so the $100 grew to $12,500. And these are these bonds that say we promise. And they each had a worst year between 1928 and 2023, ranging from almost break-even to a loss of 26%. How could it lose 26%? Because interest rates went up and the price of the bonds went down. It didn't change the, the guarantee that they, that they made, long-term guarantee to give you your money back. But in the short term, long-term bonds can have a lot of volatility, but nothing like the stock market. Let's look at the stock market. Let's not forget 2,000, 9,500, 12,500. Now we have the S&P 500, and I'm just gonna focus for right now on the S&P 500, basically the 500 largest public corporations in the United States. That has been tracked back to 1928. It didn't, the academics have done that tracking. It wasn't actually available in 1928, but they can track those 500 largest companies. And what do we know? It had a 10% compound rate of return. And it $100 didn't grow to, to, to a couple thousand. It grew to almost a million dollars. So that difference between being in a bond and being in a stock is a really, really big deal in terms of what it's likely. Remember, there's that word, likely. Even if I am a professional advisor, which I'm not anymore, I was never, ever allowed to say anything more than likely because nobody knows what the future is going to bring. But based on almost 100 years worth of information, we would say that you're likely to come out with a lot better return than in bonds. And that is because you're getting a premium for the risk of being an owner instead of a loner. Now, there are other different types of stocks that pay more I'll talk about those in a second. But I want you to see this. On a one-year basis, the best year for the stock market, I'm talking about for this index of the 500 largest, the best year was up 54%. The worst year was down 43 But if you've got the right thinking in your mind about investing for the long term, you might say, okay, that, that we know that stocks are risky for the short term, but what was the best and worst return over a 40-year period? Because that's what we're talking about. And it turns out the best 40 years was a compound rate of return of 12.5, and the worst was a, a return of 8.9, not a loss but a positive return. And so as you look at investing for the long term, particularly for the first probably 20 years of your investing career, long-term money should be in equities. That's what I believe. And here, by the way, is a wonderful graph that shows the history going back to 1926 of the upside and the downside. So yes, there is a downside to the stock market short term. All of these red areas here are the periods historically when the market was down. The blue periods 
are the story and the periods the market was up. And I will tell you something that may, may, may make you a little bit nervous, but nobody ever knows a, ahead of time what it is that's going to drive the market. What they will say generally is that future earnings and the growth of those earnings are going to drive the market higher. What is one of the natural forces that has driven the market higher? Inflation. Inflation. Just think for a second. If a company had a product that it bought for a dollar and it marked it up 50% to sell it, it means that that they would buy it for a dollar, sell it for a dollar and a half and make 50% gross margin. If because of inflation, the cost is now a dollar 10, they're going to mark that up. And now all of a sudden, instead of a 50 cent margin, they're going to have a 55 cent margin. And if people are buying the stock in that company, they are likely going to pay more for that company because they're earning more. So one of the reasons this is generally going up and up is because inflation has gone up and up. Now, in between, there are periods where people either don't trust the market short term and they get out. Lots of people are jumping in and out of the market because of how what direction they think the market's going to go because they think they can outsmart the market. There's absolutely no evidence that they will do that. So when you say, I will invest in the stock market, you have to look right and left again. And this time, you're making, again, literally a million-dollar decision. And the reason that we know that it is, is because if you put all of your money in one company versus buying, let's just for the sake of discussion, buy all 500 of those companies that are in the S&P 500. You can buy all 500 with a $10 investment. It's amazing. It really is amazing what you can do with a few dollars. Investing has never been as efficient as it is today. And one of those is the ability for even the smallest investor to be treated like a multimillionaire. And so I believe for the money that my wife and I have saved and invested that to the extent that we are in the stock market, I want to own thousands of companies. Now, I don't want to own one. And the reason I don't want to own one is because any company can go out of business. Any company. And you may not believe that, but I can tell you that when I was your age, there was a company that everybody believed was the company to count on, and that was General Motors. And what they said of General Motors before they went into bankruptcy some years ago, they said, as goes General Motors, so goes the U.S. economy. And I can also remember when I was your age, another company that people knew that if you went to work for them, even if you were just a, a, a janitor, you were going to retire a millionaire was because if you as part of your retirement savings, it went into Sears Roebuck stock. And basically, Sears also basically went out of business compared to what they were in the 60s. So the smart thing to do, the thing that people and, 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 and pension funds and all big bodies of money that really want to make sure the money is there, they diversify amongst many. And boy, the best sales pitch I know against owning a few stocks comes from a study done by Hendrik Bessenbinder out of the University of uh, or Arizona State University. Do stocks outperform T-bills? Here's what he found. 96% of all the public companies had a compound rate of return of 3% a year. 
the rest of them, the other 10%, or the other 4%, made enough to bring the rate, the, the return for all of them up to 10%. And by the way, of that 50, of that 100% of all those companies that made 10%, Half of them had a compound rate of return while they were in business of a negative 7%. So, so what we know is the only really smart way to invest for the long term, particularly if you talk to yourself and you ask yourself the question, am I a professional investor who knows the best companies to invest in for the future? And if the answer is no, I really don't. And in fact, it doesn't even look like any that very many of the professionals, and I'll talk about this, know the best companies. If you can conclude that you are not an expert or that even experts struggle with beating a portfolio of all stocks, it seems to me you should be looking down the street where, where you're going to get this huge, massive diversification. And you can do it with a few dollars. The fifth million dollar decision. Now, let's not lose sight of what it takes to make an extra half a percent. Now, sometimes to make that extra half a percent, you have to know how to earn it. For example, stocks versus bonds. Think about that for a second. If bonds make 5% and stocks make 10 that is 10 half a percent differences, which suggests that there is right there potentially a $12 million difference. And by the way, if you get 5% over your lifetime versus 10% and you live off of it, it is in fact more than a $12 million difference. But here's one that it's not about making more, it's about not spending as much as the industry wants you to spend. Because when you buy one of those mutual funds, and by the way, the way that you're able to buy 500 or 5,000 stocks at a time for $100 or $10, is you invest in a mutual fund. And I'll talk a little bit about those, more about those later, but it's just a pooling of money from thousands, if not millions of people and putting it under different kinds of professional management. I'll talk about those different kinds in a second. But those mutual funds charge you to work for you. And a lot of them charge 1% or more, and a lot of them charge one-tenth of a percent or less. So if you want to make less money, I want you to invest in those funds that charge you 1% instead of those that charge you one-tenth of 1%. Because you are virtually guaranteed to make nine-tenths of 1% less, particularly if two funds are virtually the same. And this is not uncommon. Two funds are virtually the same. One is charging one-tenth of 1%, and one is charging 1%. And you could say, why would somebody pay 1% when it could be purchased for one-tenth of 1%? Well, sometimes those people are, are in a 401k or a 403b, and the trustees have failed the, the employees and put these very expensive mutual funds inside of that 401k or 403b, and that's why I don't have any hair. Now, I have pulled out so much hair because people have been taken advantage of. Basically, I guess, either because of friendships or because of ignorance. But to the extent that you have control in your life, like in your IRA, where it doesn't have to do with somebody picking the, the investments in your 403B or your 401K, I want you to be doing the smart thing. Now then, there's another fork in the road. 
And this one, this one has got so much academic research behind it that again, the people who do this wrong simply haven't taken the time to get an education. And remember, the less educated the investor is, the more that Wall Street makes. We should never forget that. The payoff for your education to become a nurse is huge. And you have probably, if you go back and you look at, at, at the hours that you put in to getting your education, I tried to estimate it between K through 12 and, and, and going to college to get your degree, you probably have 16,000 hours of class time and homework time. 16,000 hours from which you are now going to take that information and you're going to add more information to it and experience, particularly for the first five or 10 years of, of, uh, of, of your real work, But I can tell you that with 20 hours, maybe 30 hours of easy study time, you can learn how to do these things. I will, For those of you who don't want to take the 20 to 30 hours, I am going to tell you exactly the investment I think you should make. And I'm going to show you how to tweak it in just a very small way that I think will make a difference of maybe an extra million dollars or more. But that investment will not require you to know anything but one piece of information that I know you know better than anybody on earth. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. But this fork in the road is simply this. Do I want to put my investments in a mutual fund, remember diversification, that is managed to replicate the index, all 500 of those large companies like the S&P 500, or it could be all 5,000 of the companies in the total market index, or it could be the 600 small company index, or it could be the 2,000 value index. These are There are many of these different kinds of index funds that the managers do not try to get better returns than the market. But what they do, and they charge very, very little for it, is they replicate that index, that group of stocks. So no attempt to make a better return. Just Take the return of the market. Remember, with the S&P 500, that was 10%. By the way, the average 40-year return of the S&P 500 is 11%. Whether it's 10 or 11 or 8.9 or 12.5, you're going to be somewhere, theoretically, within that range. But there are people who get paid tons of money and people pay tons of money for them to try to do it who promise to do their best. They don't promise that they're going to do better than the market, but they promise on a stack of Bibles that they will try to beat the market. And some of them do. Over a 20-year period, about one out of 10 or one out of 20, depending on the different kind of index fund it is, will actually make a little bit better than the index itself. And for that, they're going to charge an extra half a percent, an extra 1%. But here's the rest of that story. The rest of the story is the 90% that don't get the index return are creating a worse return than the index. And sometimes that worst compound rate of return is 2 to 3% a year worse. And here's the killer piece of information. Nobody knows what of which of those actively managed funds are going to do better than the index itself. So 9 out of 10 
or, or 19 out of 20 are going to underperform, but you could be at the 90% return. If you want to look at it that way, you're going to be in the top 10% or maybe the top 5% by simply owning the index. Now, what you don't have is a friend to talk to on the phone who's going to discuss how the market is doing and why the market is going up or down. But the fact is they don't know. I guarantee they don't know where the market is going because nobody knows where the market is going. And index funds are more tax efficient. Now, you saw this before. I want to circle back here because there's a great lesson here. Remember when we looked at the bond funds, the, the, the different categories, that there were some that made less because they were less risky. So you went from 3.3 to 4.9 to 5.2 in return as the bonds were more risky. Well, it turns out all the academic research shows the same thing with stocks. As you go from the S&P 500, which is very high quality relative to these other indexes, you'll notice you go from a 10% return to companies that are, that are out of favor as a group. There are actually some of these out of favor companies in here with the S&P 500, but this is the large cap value. They're all large companies, but they're not the hot dogs. They're not the NVIDIAs and the, and, and the Facebooks. And they are slower moving. Johnson and Johnson, uh, you know, the, 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 could be consumer goods. It could be uh, Walmart. They're good companies, but they're not hot dogs. Notice they made 1% more. And instead of growing to 950,000, it grew to almost 2.3. Then if you went to smaller companies that were a combination of growth and value, good ones and out of favor ones, you get another almost 1%, 11.9. And finally, with smaller companies that are out of favor, that index has compounded at 13.2, looking backwards. Remember, no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. And we know that about the rest of our life if we think about it. Many of us who have, have, have suffered through more than one marriage, if you asked us, do you think that it would have helped if you'd had a therapist work with you before you got married the first time? I think most of us say, yeah, yeah, we should have gotten professional help. Most of life is this way. When we look back, we know what we should have done. And one of the things that I find so remarkable, so fun, when I was an investment advisor and I would sit down with a new client, and part of that is you'll spend an hour or two hours just getting to know about that person and you, and you look into their life story and you find out that every one of them has some random event way back when. In my case, that when it was just going out the door of a fraternity and instead of going to a, to a restaurant where I wanted to go for dinner, instead I went to a street dance and ended up meeting my, my wife at uh, age 19. And a uh, random event. And random events get us through life. And a lot of those are lucky random events, and a lot of those are unlucky. And what Wendy is trying to do and what I am trying to do is where we know that there's a lot of luck involved. For example, investing. We want to encourage you to take the steps that take all of the, of the luck, good or bad, out of the process and put the probabilities of success in your best interest, but there's still going to be luck. And by the way, these different equity asset classes have different highs and different lows. 
and we've provided a PDF to Wendy, and uh, and, and and if she hasn't put that uh, in the, or maybe she sent it to you, uh, you'll be able to go back and review uh, all of these slides. So those small companies, they made more money. So maybe we should have some of that in our portfolio. After all, if they made 11.9%, the, the blend, or 132 couldn't I have a little bit in my portfolio? Do I have to have all of my money in the S&P 500, where most people have all of their money? Is there it make any sense to do that? The answer, of course, looking backwards, is yes, absolutely. At least a little bit. Same thing with value. Companies that are out of favor. Whether they're large companies or small companies, would make sense to have some money in value companies somehow? And again, the answer is yes. Because value has a, a, a rate of return, a premium that they can track back to 1928 and before. Just like growth as well. The thing about growth that is tricky and the reason growth doesn't do as well as you're probably thinking it would because isn't it all those hot dog companies, the Microsofts of the world, et cetera, that are going to really make us a lot of money? And the answer is within those groups of stocks that are so popular, people pay enormous what they call price to earnings ratios. They pay up and up and up. For those companies right now, those growth companies, they might be paying investors 20 to 25 times earnings, sometimes even more. But then when those companies disappoint, they fall precipitously down to maybe 15 times earnings because they don't meet the expectations of investors. Investors tend to see the future through rose-colored glasses. That's the good news. The bad news is those rose-colored glasses have a tendency to paint the future much better than it is likely to be. Here is the tool I talked about earlier. This is the work of Daryl Ball. Daryl Balls is one of our volunteers. He is a retired engineer from the Boeing Company. He is brilliant. He is caring. His goal is to help each and every one of you do better. And here is how he is helping us here. He went back to the academics work where they show every year going back to 1928, how you would have done, the red is the S&P 500, the green is small cap blend, the blue is small cap value, the purple is large cap value. And in each one of those boxes is how that different group of stocks, the 500, did. As a group, they were up 43%. The large cap value stocks as a group were up 24 plus percent. And when I originally asked him for a table, I hadn't asked for this and I hadn't even thought of the colors. He did that. But then he also gave me the four fund strategy, how it did. And you will notice that it did the average of these other of the four. So it's right in the middle, 36.8. Who would complain? Well, nobody complained about any of those returns. Now, as we go through all 96 years, the whole table is one year at a time. So what you could do is you could look at this one year at a time from the number one to the number five. And some years you're going to find, wait a minute, I mean, let me show you here. Let me let me pull out 2000 to, through 2002. Small cap value up 19, 28, and 6. S&P 500 down 9, down 11, down 22. They're 
It's like they're out of different universes. And in a sense, that's the beauty for whatever reason. And we can theorize many ways. These major equity asset classes do their own thing. And what we see is through diversification, and the academics say diversification among different equity asset classes is more important than whether you have 100 of the 500 or 250 or 500 or you go to 1,000. Owning more of that same asset class is not going to do much for you, but owning more than one equity asset class pays a premium. Looking backwards, notice that the highest performing equity asset classes, the red, it's the easiest to spot, is on the bottom a lot. And it should be because it is the highest quality. Remember, higher quality suggests lower returns. If we also added the bonds here, they would even be lower because they are higher, higher quality. Okay, lots to see, but let's make it a little simpler. What Daryl did was he broke it down each with each of these four major asset classes and the four fund strategy. He broke it down and said, how often was that asset class in the top quintile, the top 20%? How often was it in the second, third, fourth, and the fifth, the, the, the lowest 20%? So the small cap value may have had the highest return, and it had the highest percentage, 38% of the time it was in the top quintile, but it spent two-thirds of the time below. The S&P 500 that compounded at 10 was 28% of the time in the top quintile. Not bad, not bad for something that's supposed to be at the bottom. But it, it also spent 41% of the time at the bottom where we think it should be. But the yearly returns are obviously random. But sometimes when the red is at the bottom six or seven years in a row, it starts to feel like it's not random and it's never going to be number one again. Well, I could say, trust me, it will be, but I can't say trust me because I don't know it will ever be number one again. But history says it will spend part of the time at the top, part of the time at the bottom. But here's what I'm looking for you for. This is why I'm here right now, is to show you this. In fact, the whole presentation is worth seeing this. And that is the four fund strategy. A little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. The compound rate of return was 11.8%. The compound rate of return of the S&P 500 was 10. Now, as we've said many times, if you look at any 40 year period, it's gonna be all over the place between the highs and the lows of each one of these asset classes. But I'm looking for a half a percent. For all those people who think large cap blend is the place they want to have their money because that is the safe place to be, I'm here to say for my money, a combination of asset classes is a safer place to be than being in the S&P 500. Let me go back for one second. You look at the volatility of the S&P 500 one year at a time. You don't see it right in the middle all of the time or most of the time. You see it all over the place most of the time. So diversification. And we have on a page I'm not going to talk about today port a number of portfolios from 10 different funds all the way down to two where we show the, the returns, the risk, the volatility, all the things that we think are important. Number nine, this one, this one's a little subtle, but I'm gonna tell you, market timing, jumping in and out of the market. 
moving out because the market's going down and you just don't want to lose any more money. You've, you saved for 30 years and all of a sudden your, your million dollars is down to 800 and you just can't take it anymore. It's called the ICSIA market timing strategy. I can't stand it anymore. And when you do that, you then also have to decide when to get back in. And all of the studies show that people's attempt to get out smartly, intelligently, hopefully, does not add money over time. I even meet people today who have been sitting in major cash positions since 2008 when the market went down terribly because they, they just couldn't take it anymore. So we really believe from all of the academic research, as uncomfortable as it can be, that's the reason you're getting the premium for the risk. If you don't get let the market be what it is, you're not likely to get the premium. And the risk is that you jump out at exactly the worst time and you don't get back in. This is another subtle one, but it's a guarantee I can make uh, that I don't think anybody will argue with me. I can't guarantee what return that you'll make over the long term. I can guarantee that if you had put an equal amount of money every year in Enron, a company that went bankrupt, but if while it was a legitimate public company and it was the seventh largest company in the US, if you put money into Enron and with $100 every month, if the market was higher, the value was higher, you bought fewer shares, and if the market was lower, you bought more shares. Guaranteed. Because if you put in $100 and it's 10, you buy 10 shares. If it's five, you buy 20 shares. And if it doesn't go bankrupt or it doesn't end up below $10 a share, well, it can even be below $10 a share and you win. But if it goes bankrupt and you lose everything, Buying all those extra shares didn't do any good. On the other hand, if you were investing in the S&P 500, it went up and it went down. It's had an average loss about every four or five years of 30%. Twice from 2000 through 2009. It had losses of over 50% twice. On the other hand, this is worth noting, if you were diversified amongst a bunch of different equity asset classes, you actually made 5 to 10% over that same period of time. Equity asset class diversification can be huge. But dollar cost averaging forces you to buy more shares when it's out of favor and fewer shares when it's in favor. This one, we all know that higher taxes is not a benefit to us. Now, I am not against paying taxes. But if I know that you're investing for the long term and you're a young investor, and a young worker and probably not at a very high tax rate, your marginal tax rate is not very high, then I know that when you put money into a regular IRA, you are going to get a refund based on your marginal tax rate that might give you back 10 cents or 15 cents or 20 cents on the dollar. For which you will do what? Go out and have dinner? Go on a long weekend? On the other hand, if instead of a regular IRA, you put it into a Roth IRA, that would mean that you did not get a refund of 10 or 15 or 20% that you, that you enjoyed. But what you did get was tax-free 
tax-free growth for the rest of your life, at least under present tax regulations. And I can't guarantee what those will be in the future either. So what do we know? We know that by not getting a relatively small amount back, that when I take money out of my my, my investments in the Roth in retirement, there is no tax. And when I die and leave that money, whatever's left over to my kids, there is no tax. It's a big deal. And I want to tell you, when I was your age, when I first went, started investing back in the early 60s, the highest marginal tax rate was 90%. And when I was in the industry in the in the 66, it was 70%. We have no idea what the marginal tax rate is going to be at the federal level or at the state level. So there are some smart things you can do that lead to huge tax implications. And the last piece, let me just check the time, how I'm doing. I'm doing okay, maybe a little long, but I'm going to keep going. Number 12, for those of you who really, really don't want to be involved making any decisions except for two things, two decisions you're going to make. You're going to promise yourself you're going to save for the future. Whether it's 5% in the beginning or 3% in the beginning or 1% in the beginning, and then every year you get a, you're going to raise it by 1% or 2%, 3% until you get it up to 15% or 10%, you're going to promise yourself something. And I will tell you, it's a promise worth keeping. And something else in your life is going to be sacrificed. We know that. I have been a diet since the fifth grade. I've been on a diet. I have lost over 4,000 pounds. I have sacrificed at so many meals. And if I hadn't sacrificed at those meals, I shudder to think how much I would weigh today. Sacrifice has its payoff. And when it comes to making the decision about saving, it's only between you. I mean, it just there's nobody else there to fight with you. On the other hand, this is an interesting decision, and that is, when do I plan to retire? Typical answer, ASAP. I have been working with the white coat investor people for years. That's a newsletter that's for doctors, and by the way, it's as good for, for, for nurses as it is for doctors. And it amazes to me when I've been at a conference and talked to doctors who are in their 40s who are working to get... To, to, to become retired by the time they're 45 or 50. I know when my mother was a nurse, nobody was talking about retiring at 50 or even 60. So you pick a date. And I, for the sake of discussion, I'm hoping you will pick a date. There's a reason here for 2065 or 2070 because you can buy a target date fund for those people who want to retire in 2065 or 2070 or 2050 or 2040. And these funds, I said it earlier, it's the best for people who do not want to try to fine tune on a daily basis or an annual basis or an Whenever, just they want somebody that they truly believe will act in their best interest. Let me give you the history because it's important to understand these because they will be the fund that will be the basic investment that most of you will likely use. And they're not bad. They're not perfect. And I'll sh try to show you how to make them better. But... They have what it takes for you to get where I think most of you are trying to go. It includes mutual funds. So you're going to get a fund of funds, basically. So that you're going to have some 
U.S., some international, mostly large, maybe a little bit of small. You're going to have some, some bonds later on as you get older, maybe a little bit of bonds right now. And the funds will be either actively managed or index-like. Use index-like. Vanguard has them. Schwab has them. BlackRock has them. If your clinic or your hospital or whatever it is, is using actively managed funds, shame. Shame on them. Because that is that is so in opposition to what the largest retirement funds in America are doing. People that are that are run by folks who are uh, as, as smart as anybody on Wall Street, index funds. And then they get it, then they are run as a target date fund where they are professionally managed. You get all this diversification. You can do it with a low minimum. You have high liquidity if you have to get out of them. And uh, if you want to have your money spread amongst a whole bunch of different kinds of funds other than the target fund, date fund, they are inside of a fund where you can do that, a fund family. And that's how mutual funds are run. Index funds, I've already talked about it. Index funds, you do get professional management, diversification, low minimum, low to no fees, tax efficient, and higher expected returns because they have those lower fees and lower taxes. The target date fund, you pick the year. They come in five-year increments. That's all you do for the rest of your life, literally, for the rest of your life. You never have to do anything else but take the responsibility for putting the money in and then taking the money out. Almost every plan where you all will be working will have target date funds available. Hopefully with uh, an opt out, you automatically are opted in and you have to opt out. The reason that's important is because when people are given the, the responsibility to opt in about, uh, um, I don't know, under 50% of the people do. When you have to opt out, only about 27% of the less, there's about 17% will opt out. Way more people are willing to adjust when they are forced to invest and have to ask to quit. It's just an emotional thing for people. But you get the professional stock diversification. You get the asset allocation diversification. And here is the glide path from two very well-known target date funds. So you'll get an idea of how it works. When you are young and you are many years away from retirement, let's say for the sake of discussion, we're talking here, here you are at retirement, out here at age, let's call it 65. So, so we can see where you're going to start out. They're going to have you 10% of your money in bonds, 90% of your money in stocks if you're at Vanguard. On the other hand, if you're at BlackRock, notice they don't have any, any bonds in the early years. To which I say, way to go. Bravo. I love it. Because I don't want you to be in bonds when you're in your 20s and your 30s. So the point here is every target date fund has got potentially something about it that one might not like. But notice what happens here when we get out, to, well, to my age at 80. So that, that that would be some 20 years, I'm sorry, 15 years, they would have me at uh, BlackRock 40% in equities. They would have me 30% in equities at Vanguard. Well, my wife and I are 50% in equities. I don't want to be that conservative. And that could that could be because 
we have more money than we need, we're trying to invest money for our heirs, or we have a different understanding of the risk of the market. I have lots of friends who are my age and are all equities all the time. In fact, some have got a portfolio of 10 or 20 stocks. I couldn't do that. That's the thing about investing. It's a very personal thing. And what we're trying to do and others like us is to give you the education so that you personally can make these decisions. But think, your money's being managed like a pension fund would be managed. You never have to second guess the market. You never have to second guess asset class. They do all the rebalancing that you may or may not know is a good thing to do. You're not as likely to chase performance because you trust somebody is there keeping track of what should be done. And here, I, I when I tell you this, I hope you never forget this study from Wharton. Wharton looked at 1.2 million 401k plans at Vanguard. Some of them were totally in target date funds. Some of those people were totally on their own doing what they thought was the best thing to do. Maybe deciding to be in and out of the market. Maybe deciding to have a, a lot of cash in their portfolio or bonds in their portfolio just because 20% more than stocks just seemed too risky for them. Whatever the reason they did what they did. They didn't use target date funds. And what they found was the, the research at Wharton showed that those people who were all in target date funds had a 2.3% compound rate of return, higher expected return for the long term than the people who were 100% on their own. And that tells me that if you really don't get it, uh, then you have a choice. You might say, you know something, it's worth it to, to pay somebody 1% to do it for me, to decide what asset classes I should be in. On the other hand, you could just be in a target day fund. Or if you understood, understood the weaknesses of target day funds, you would know something else, that the weaknesses are that they are likely going to make less because they have bonds in the early years, like I pointed out at Vanguard. Uh, you would also be some weakness because they have very little small cap and value. The interesting thing is, with just a little bit of small cap value, and this is from a study that Chris Pedersen has done. I'm going to show you the cover of his book and recommend you read it. But his, and, and, and he, by the way, has got a wonderful uh, a video about this strategy. But basically, instead of going just into the target date fund at Vanguard, he suggests you put 90% uh, of every dollar into the target date fund and 10% into small cap value or 20% into small cap value and 80%. And it shows historically over 40 year period, how much more that you would have theoretically based on the past. So that I think is a, it, it, is a, just a simple, simple, you set it up, put it on automatic, just like you just, instead of just putting everything in the target date fund, put it in two different funds. I added this to my presentation at the last minute. A lot of people really don't understand the stock market and how it works as an investor. And I talked around it in my presentation, but I want to focus on it more more closely so that you become a better investor. I want you to truly understand what you're starting when you start investing. And I don't care how little you want to be involved. You are this that I'm about to tell you. You are in a partnership. You are in a partnership in a new business. It is a combination of your money and whatever funds, for example, that you put it into. And you need to understand 
that you are an important part of the partnership. In fact, way more important than the funds you're investing in. They could basically care less about you. No, you are the big time important uh, partner here. And so that's the way it is in the beginning. And I'll show you that in just a second. But later on, you become less important. But let me just show you what I mean by this and what it's going to be like. Because the better you understand this partnership and what it's likely to be like, the better you are to be in that partnership. Remember when I talked earlier about getting some some work with a with a therapist before you get into a marriage? Well, this is kind of what that is this is about. Because let me show you what it's really like or what it would have been like if from 1970 to 2023 you had started with a thousand dollars and you put in on a monthly basis eighty three dollars and thirty three cents and by the end of the first year you had put in a thousand dollars here's that contribution right here thousand dollars far right now at the end of the year you have the outcome of your partnership with the s p 500 go over two columns to where it says 100% equity, and that was the outcome. You put in a 1,000. Your partner that you count on and you think is a big deal contributes $22 to the process. And you might say, you know, I worked really hard for that $1,000. As far as I'm concerned, I don't see that you're exactly holding up your part of the bargain. And maybe if you could have that conversation with the manager, they might explain how the market works and sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down. And maybe you go away satisfied and maybe you go away grumbling and you decide to give it another year. And the next year, because every year here, you're going to increase the contribution by 3%. You put in 1,030 and at the end of two years, it's worth $2,275. You have put in over $2,000. You've made a couple hundred dollars. You are still not sensing the long-term success of this partnership that was promised. Now, it's never promised because if you read the prospectus, they promise nothing. Except they'll do what you're paying them to do in this particular case is to offer you an index fund that replicates the S&P 500. By the third year, you put in over $3,000, and now you're up to $3,800. Well, let me fast forward to the end of the first 10 years, and you're worth $16,000, and you have put in over $11,000. What's wrong with this picture? You are not getting the 10% a year that you thought you were going to get. Because at 10% a year, you would have had more. This is one of the worst 10 years of the last 50. The compound rate of return for the S&P 500 was about 5%. But they kept convincing you somehow that things are going to get better. And by the way, if you ask them ever, can you guarantee that? Can you give me some, will you give me a probability? Well, they'll give you the same probability they know about the past and blame it on the past, but it isn't going to be it isn't going to be very good because it will show that a lot of times you don't get a very good return at the end of 10 years. Well, look what happens the next 10 years to your partnership. Let's just jump down to the end of now 20 years. That year, you're putting in 1,754. The portfolio value at the end of 20 years is $116,000. And at the end of the next 10 years, look at this, $700,000. And you just put in $2,357. You might even be saying, is it, it by the way, by the way, 
This was all starting with 1,000. Multiply this times what you are going to start with. 3,000, all right, multiply times 3. 4,000, multiply, multiply times 4, what you would have at the end of 30 years, but you're going 40. Now you're going to learn a really big lesson, a lesson that I hope you will never forget because in this next 10 years, we have another bad 10 years for the S&P 500. So you started at 699 and you end at 662. You lost money even though each year you put in $3,000. It was not a good 10 years for one equity asset class. Now, for the sake of just showing you what happens if you look at the next page, this next page is using a different portfolio. A portfolio that I am sure 5% of you will end up using as you put money aside in some part of your portfolio. Maybe it'll be in your IRA outside of your 401k. It's a portfolio that is instead of the S&P 500 is half in the S&P 500 and the other half is in small cap value. We give you lots of names of small cap value funds you could invest in, but I want you to see how the portfolio is half in each did at the end of 10 years, instead of 16,000, it's 23,000. At the end of 20 years, instead of 120,000, it's 170,000. At the end of 30 years, instead of 870, uh, 699, it's 871. Here is the, the decade that really makes the difference. And this is the part about diversification we never know. Because diversification guarantees that sometimes you're going to be in good stuff and bad stuff. No, I'm sorry. Diversification means you're probably always in good stuff and some stuff that's worse. Not having diversification means you're either going to be in what's good and unfortunately all in what's bad. But for that next decade, from, 19, uh, from 2000 to 2009, the portfolio that was half large blend and half in small value ended not at less, but at virtually 50% more, let's say 1,346,000. Now, I want to show you something pretty cool. Pretty cool. If you had been over that 40-year period, 60% in that equity portfolio, half small cap value, half S&P 500, and the other 40% in bonds, you would have been at 866. These tables that we build, I'm about to recommend an education that maybe a third of you will take the time to take because it is going to take time and you don't have it in your life, but I think it's worth taking but these kind of tables, they are built to educate people about the ride. And before I show you the, that education very briefly, I just want to say that each and every one of you, boy, I hope you will put a, a, a saving program, a plan. I really want you to build a plan that includes how much you're going to save, how you're going to pay off your debt. How are you going to build up your emergency fund? And I want to talk about Empower. It's a it's a free service, free from not for now, anyhow. Uh, that will help you build a budget. If 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 you're not a natural budget builder, uh, these things are important. I, I I know the reason I weigh as much as I as I do. Uh, I have always had diet plans that I've read, then I put the book away, and I go to the restaurant. I have never taken the plan to the restaurant. 
And uh, the odds are that if I had taken the plan to the restaurant and had to face that plan as I made the decision to choose the food I'm going to eat, I would weigh less or else, or else the plan would say, when you go out for dinner, only eat half of the dessert. If I only ate half of the desserts I ate over my lifetime, I, I, I would be 30, at least 30 pounds lighter. That's the way plans work. And they don't have to be complex. For a diet, two sides of a three by five card. That's all I need. One side is the diet and the other side is the exercise program. I'd like to think it's no more complicated than that here. Here is our boot camp. Each one of these links will take you to a decision that have to do with accumulating, building a portfolio, taking money out when you're in, in, in uh, retirement, that two funds for life that I talked about. In each case, there's an article, there's a podcast, there's a video, and there are tables galore. Because I can't be your personal advisor. And that's at paulmerriman.com. This book is free. There's the, the QR quote if you, if, if, you, if you want it. The last half of the book is about two funds for life in a simple way. The first half is about the $12 million decisions. Here is a book. This book is written by an engineer. It goes into more detail than I do, but it is a terrific read. Yes, you can buy these books uh, at Amazon, but I'm encouraging you to, to, to use the PDF in the hopes that you'll just forward that PDF to everybody you know. And this book is a killer book. You may not want to read the main book because it's about the psychology of investing. But for sure, I want you to start by going to the index and reading the 16-page syllabus, if you will, of a book entitled Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, a 500-page book that probably none of you would finish. Most people have a hard time getting through the first 250 pages, but it's it's an amazing academic book. Uh, the first part is written for all of us, the last half. Now, that's the 500-page book. In 16 pages... You are th th there are 48 different biases that are going to impact your investing. Recency bias, home bias. I mean, there's so many uh, biases, emotional biases that ground our decisions that are not in your best interest. You know, when 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 you trust one country more than any other place in the world, you're not likely to diversify. But that's the way people in Greece feel, people in Japan feel. I mean, people just feel like their own country is number one. So home bias can cause a lot of problems. The bias to the S&P 500 has cost people millions of dollars. But that's the companies they know and they trust. They don't know all the, those companies that are in the small cap value uh, portfolio. But just read those 16 pages and then understand that in Paul's book, he explains how to manage around those, those, those biases that you have. Recency bias, chasing fads, herd bias, following the herd over the cliff. I mean, these things are real and they have cost people real life savings. And it is our attempt without being there with you to help you as we can. And I know I've talked longer than I was supposed to. Wendy, I, I honor what you're doing for these young people so much. I really appreciate you giving me the time to, to address them. I hope they all know Paul at paulmerriman.com. Remember, in the subject line, Texas A&M, come on, give me a chance to Use that as a sorting, and uh, and even after I'm gone, because I've tried to, with my wife and I have tried to fund our our nonprofit so that after I'm gone there will be others to carry on, 
and as Wendy knows, we also have a project at a, uh, a university, Western Washington University up in Bellingham, Washington, where we're working on every student who goes through Western will get about 40 hours of financial literacy. We are absolutely committed to helping. Now I got questions. I'm happy to uh, happy to answer. All right, guys, I'm going to, if you uh, have a question, you can either put it in the chat and I will read it. Or if you uh, want to come off of mute, you can um, just, you know, tell Mr. Merriman your first name and, and ask the question. Anybody got any questions? It's a lot of amazing information. Uh, it's uh, It's too much, I know. I do encourage people to go back and watch it. Uh, I do have a question, Mr. Merriman. I'm Lexi. Nice to meet you. Lexi, nice to see you. As I mentioned earlier, I have a daughter, Lexi. <laughs> That's it. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that within, say, 20 to 30 hours of study that we could become uh, at least advanced enough within or comfortable enough with investments that we could start making some of these conclusions that you pointed out to us by ourselves. With those 20 to 30 hours of study time, do you recommend simply just reading those books or in those links that you gave to us? Or do you have other recommendations of resources that we should use as well? Well, let me let me give you a, a future answer because in the future, each one of those pages will have links to a lot of articles and things that from other people we trust. Um, we want to help in more than just giving you the information we have to offer. We also have a page called Truth Tellers. And I do not get paid a penny from any of these people, like an affiliate program where if they link to, uh, to, to, to their site that I'll, we'll get some money. We don't do that uh, with them at all. But those are great websites for learning, depending on what it is that, that you want to learn. What we do believe is that in every major fork in the road you're going to get on that page is enough information for you to make the decisions. For example, the first one is devoted to the made the 10 great equity asset classes. It doesn't tell you which ones, how to put them together, but shows you the historical impact of those 10 equity asset classes. Later on, we actually give you in another one of those the names of the funds or ETFs that you could put money into to get access to those equity asset classes. Now, some people use all 10, some people use two, and we show people how to build them in different ways. And in each case, we show you the risk and the return implications so that you're you're, you're, you've got all of these tables, and I don't want you to be an expert on every table. I want you to know the table that probably applies to who you are. And you might even get down to the point where you got, you know, I can't decide between this one and this one. And you finally email me and you say, here's who I am. Which one of these would you advise? And of course, I'll tell you, I can't give you personal advice because it's illegal, but what I know about you, this is what I would do for myself. And I have always taken whatever legal liability there is in being willing to help people. Even when I was an investment advisor, I gave people free advice all the time. As a matter of fact, I built my business by teaching people how to do it on their own. And if they didn't want to do it, we'd do it for them. I just don't do it for them anymore, but I've always been willing to tell people what I think they should do because I'm never doing something that's self-serving. But I could be wrong. Awesome. Thank you so much. As a quick follow-up question, you also mentioned that the four uh, fund strategy is for people that want to be a little bit more involved in uh, choosing what they want with their initial investments and things. How, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. How and what is the least amount of involved that you think we can be? So say, I wanna be involved at first, then I hit 
a very busy time of my life. And so for yep. five years or so, I got can't it. be involved. Got it. Beautiful question. If you were going to be use the four fund strategy, and by the way, the two fund strategy is only two tenths of a diff, of, of of a two tenths higher of return long term, but we give you the four funds as exchange traded funds, which you could easily do it at Fidelity, and and you could just go to Fidelity, open up a Roth IRA, for example. And put your money into those four funds. Uh, and then you don't need to do anything. Every year, you just put more money into those four funds. Now, we may change a fund because we find a fund we think is not, not better for the next year or two, but only better for the very long term. We never make a change unless we think it is going to impact people for the long term, but you don't have to do anything but put money into the same four funds for the rest of your life. Now, at some point in time, you say, wait a minute, I am now 50. Should I have all of this money in these four equity funds or should I have part of my money in bonds? And I can tell you by the end of this year, we will have uh, exact recommendations uh, for different kinds of investors on when you add the bonds and how much. So it probably, worst case, it's an hour or a year. Best case, it's 15 minutes because there's not much to do. Perfect. I think that really answers my question. Uh, as a aside to something that you answered with, you said the two fund strategy is two tenths um, less equitable, equitable than the four funds. Uh, I'm so sorry, four fund strategy. Um, with the two fund strategy, are you referring to the two, the 20% and the SCV or the 50% and the SCV? No, the, the, the 50%. As a matter of fact, you would get a very good return if you used the target date fund and 50% small cap value. Uh, and and you when you go to Chris Pedersen's page, uh, about the two fund strategy, uh, he will have a, a a great is a great table there that that will help you. But what I was talking about, good point. I was talking about putting half your money in the in the small cap value and half your money in the S and P five hundred. My my granddaughter, year and a half old granddaughter, we gave her money when she was born. It's half in small cap value and half uh, in in the S and P five hundred kind of a fund. I'm hoping she'll keep that money there. It will be moved into a Roth IRA as soon as she starts earning money by her uh, my, my my Lexi, uh, and uh, and and uh, that's what we hope that she'll do. Never put bonds with it. But you might want to have bonds later on in order to 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 reduce the volatility as you get close to retirement. Okay, thank you so much. I'll stop taking up so much of the time. Thank you for your questions. Any other questions for Mr. Merriman? And those were great. Yeah. While they're thinking for a second, I want you to know, Mr. Merriman, that our dean was actually on the beginning of the first hour of the presentation, and she wanted me to extend a heartfelt thank you for being willing to come and speak to our um, nursing students to help get them off on the right foot, uh, or the correct foot, I guess, um, with their investing future, but also um, just really starting to set up their their dream of what it is that they hope to accomplish. We have a tremendous um, culture here of really having um, people who believe in selfless service. And I think that this is just another way to set them ahead of the game so that someday, like yourself, what you're doing for your university or for the things that are closest to your heart, if we are really thoughtful about these things, then we can be so much more generous uh, with our families, with our friends, and with the, the 
organizations that we care deeply for. So um, I just want to say that that is an amazing thing that comes out of the education you provide. And I personally thank you for that. Does anybody? Yeah, I, Go I, ahead. I really appreciate that, Wendy. And the thing that young people may not understand is that the world is just waiting for them to accumulate wealth so they can help them spend it. And that's the system. I, I'm not being critical of the system because uh, with, without it, I wouldn't be making this presentation here. And 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 what we need to understand is that the minute we take money out of that portfolio and put it in somebody else's pocket, it sits there forever. If you pay a load, a commission to buy, I didn't even talk about this today, to buy a mutual fund. Most mutual funds or half the mutual funds have a commission, oftentimes five and a half, five point seven five percent to buy it, which means instead of 10,000 going to work, 9,500 goes to work. And a lot of people say, well, it's only a half a percent. I, it only paid it once. No, you didn't just pay it once. You just put $9,500 to work instead of $10,000. If that $500 had been left in there, you would have, in essence, made an extra half a percent a year for the rest of your life. And then you die. And what that had grown to is left to others to spend or, or to help others. And so we have to be vigilant. And that industry, I, I remember when I went into the brokerage industry in 1966. And uh, a guy named Chris literally put his arm around me and said, Paul, I know you're here to help. I mean, he could see that I, I had passion about trying to help people. He said, we are not in this business to make money for people. And I just, I mean, my jaw dropped. Wait a minute. That's why I'm here. And he said, we first and foremost need to be need to become like a child in a family. It should be as difficult to, to fire us and move on to some other advisor as kicking a kid out of the house. It's all about building loyalty. And the more you know about the financial industry, the more that you would find out it is about loyalty. Now, doesn't everybody want loyalty? Well, yes, of course they do. Every business wants a brand that everybody trusts. But what we need to understand is sometimes we are paying a cost that is way, way more than what we realize. And as John Bogle uh, had said in his wonderful book, The Little Book of Common Sense Investing, uh, he, he makes the point that expenses go on forever. Returns are one year at a time. But expenses go on forever. So whether it's the expense to buy, the expense to hold, the expense to liquidate, all of those are, are under the microscope for us. And, and, and people need to find people to follow, like our organization and the other truth tellers, the people who are really on your side. Not because they 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 will ever know who you are. I had a guy write to me last week and say, "You are going to make millions of dollars more for me than what I was doing." And I want to say thanks, but I'll never know you. So our, our, we are not about uh, about knowing and feeling good about it. We are ab ab about simply reaching out and like any textbook and hoping the textbook is going to help. But we know that your ability to ask questions of the author of that textbook will help you at a time that you're feeling a little overwhelmed. And so we think that's what uh, what makes a difference. Larry Swedrow is a truth teller. 
Larry Swedro is a man, is a multimillionaire, and yet you write him a question uh, from one of his books, and his books are tremendous. But if you write him a question, you're likely to get a response the same night. And he lives in St. Louis. So, and I live on the Pacific Coast. So, you know, there are people who are probably might be considered a little crazy uh, in our business, but but that you know you got to find those people. You want good mentors. Absolutely agree. All right. Any other questions uh, for Mr. Merriman? All right. If not, I'm going to actually stop recording.